we've got, thank you. Give these guys a big hand because we have a hell of a conversation. What we want to do is talk about uh, where the world of media has gone and couldn't do it with uh, two better people. Richard Plepler is here, of course, uh, runs HBO with his partner, Mike Lombardo, who's here, who's here. Game of Thrones, you all know John Oliver, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, you, you, you know them all. And, and of course, Jimmy's here, and uh, you all know Jimmy, uh, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Tupac, uh, Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson, Lady Gaga, Lady Gaga Eminem, Man. Beats, now Apple Music. Uh, I will ask Jimmy for his uh, review of vinyl and whether it was really like that in just a moment. But I'm going to go to you, Richard, first on this. Um, when you think about some of what they talked about, sort of the relationship between the suits and the artists, you were telling me a story about your first encounter with this gentleman and one of the great lessons yeah. you learned. And I thought that might be a great way to start this conversation. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely true. Um, Jimmy um, understood in his gut from the very beginning what we've tried to incorporate into the DNA of HBO, which is the sacredness of talent, the sacredness of the artist. And back in the mid-90s, when uh, Time Warner still owned the music company, there was a tremendous political brouhaha that occurred over Interscope and some of the music that was coming out of Interscope. And my boss at the time was uh, the chairman of both HBO and the chairman of the music company, so I was kind of traversing back and forth in my brief uh, four months in the music business. And I came to see Jimmy. And I said, who well, I knew a little bit, and I said to Jimmy, um, Jimmy, do they have to say, fuck the police? I mean, is, it, can they say, damn the police? Can they say, I hate the police? Is there another way for us to do this? Because everybody at, at corporate is going crazy. And he, he looked at me, and he said, look, and he, we we're sitting at the uh, end of a table, and he said, I'm, I'm out on the edge with my artists all the time. And that's where I need to be. And the second they see me climbing safely back on to the surface, it's over. And you have to understand that if you're going to work with talent and you're going to evolve talent and you're going to become a company that cares about talent. I never forgot it. Um, it has stuck with me and I think informs uh, all of our collective wisdom at HBO uh, about managing talent. It's, it's a true story and, and I learned it from this guy. That's cool. Jimmy, is there a line? Is it a lie? Is there a line? Is there a line anywhere? Oh, is there a line? You know, he's basically making the argument that, that you told them basically you gotta, you gotta always go with the artist, but well, is there a line? The line is that when most of the people see the line, few people see no line. And you know, there's always gonna be a line when you see the next thing. The next thing's always gonna scare the hell out of you, whether it's Elvis Presley or Eminem. Now, I remember when we, when we had Eminem, you know, everybody would just say to me, you know, he says this, he says that, and, you know, and I said, well, you know, that, that, that's just horse shit. You know, I'm glad it's HBO so we can curse a little bit. <laughs> but, and, um, you know, it's, there, there really isn't a line, as far as I'm concerned, in any kind of creative uh, uh, thing, you know, whether it's art or... And the, the point that Jimmy made to me then, which I remember very vividly, is this is, this is their context. You don't understand their context. They're creating art from their context, and you need to give them that leeway. And, of course, if you watch the movie straight out of Compton, and you see it with the benefit of a little distance, you see how right he was. Well, I, I have a line, personally, you know what I mean, which I, I do have a line. I mean, you know, uh, uh, child pornography or, you know, anything that's just too far out. I just, you know, I have my own personal line, which I, which I apply. I don't care if it's hypocritical. I just apply it myself. But as far as uh, music and aggression, and no, I, don't, I don't have a line. There. Okay, but what about the commercial line? For HBO, you just picked up uh, Bill Simmons. I think Bill Simmons is hopefully still here. Uh, I gave Bob Iger a hard time last year at this conference about the future of Bill Simmons uh, at ESPN at the time. They had a relationship with the NFL. Are there relationships that you have that you feel like are sacred? Not that would get in the way of artistic voices with integrity and that are original, no. Um, John Oliver did a f fairly well-reported and seminal piece on net neutrality uh, last year that absolutely was not consonant with 
the position of corporate. I would no more call John or Mike would no more call John and say you can't do it after we read the main story um, th then we would shut the show down. It's just not it's just not who we are. We hire Bill because he's an original voice. We think he's very smart. We think his 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 uh, voice is aligned with ours and we're going to let him do his thing. The second we get in the middle of that, we stop being who we are. Okay. To the point, though, about the relationship between the suits and artists, I want to go to music, and then I want to try to understand the disruption, not only that took place in your industry, but the disruption that might be taking place right now in the TV business. Today in the music world, the prevailing view is it's terrible if you're an artist, that whether it's Apple Music or Spotify before that or Pandora, all of this streaming stuff, terrible. the only way to make a dollar is to go out on the road. Yeah. Tell us, tell us what the real deal is. Well, True? Not true? Um, well, both. And um, here's the deal. 2000, you know, I was sitting there. We had a great time. We had Eminem, Black Eyed Peas, and all this stuff. And it was really interesting. We just sold our company to Universal. And it was an extraordinary time. And then all of a sudden, the great invader from the north, Napster, came along. And like, OK, what do we do with this, you know? And um, so I panicked, you know? and. Um, I started to get into tech, and I went up to meet all the different companies, try to understand it, you know? So you, you have to spend the time and try to understand what you're dealing with. But as far as artists are concerned, we have a, we have a problem in the industry that I believe, well, it's, I'm out of the record industry now, I'm just doing Apple Music, but we have a problem with this whole free issue. You know, right now the television industry doesn't have it, the movie industry doesn't have it, but the record industry has it. And in my personal opinion, this is not Apple's opinion, this is my opinion, that free is a real issue and you have to find, make a service of service in order to get over free. But this whole thing about freemium, maybe at one time we needed it and it needed to get it, but right now, to me, it's a shell game because what these companies are doing are building the old school traffic. They realize, okay, Snapchat has 100 million people. It's worth $16 billion. So if I have 100 billion people and a, small, and, and a model that actually has a subscription as well, what's my company worth? And they're building an audience on the back of the artist. And that bugs me. You know, it really bugs me. And, you know, it's a shell game. It's like we need this, but they don't really need it because we're, we're, we don't have a pay service. If Apple... We don't have a free service, rather. If, if we did a free service, we'd have 500 million people free uh, on our service, you know? But we don't want to do that. We believe we built something powerful enough and strong enough that it will work. So if you're an artist and you put out a record, and most artists only have one or two hit records, and you, my watch is ringing, and if you put, uh, if you put a, um, if you put a song out and you have a hit, you got 100 million streams, on certain services, you only get paid on 75% of those streams. So how's an artist gonna live like that? So what they do is then they say, okay, I'm not gonna make any money in, in, on, in, at the records, so I'm gonna go on tour. And I had some really big acts in, the, in, the, in, in about five or seven years ago that I used to say, come off the road. They said, we don't make any money on our records. I said, well, your next record's gonna flop because Bruce Springsteen and Pink Floyd and the Rolling Stones, all those records that you loved, those guys took took a year, a year and a half off to make their albums. So what I'm hearing now from the labels is, we don't have enough worldwide superstars. Well, there's a good reason for that, because the records are taking a backseat to all the touring, and they should at least be equal, and they're not right now. So you're seeing the album being really beat up. So that, you know, I hope that answers your question, but. Um... <laughs> Let me try to apply that, though, to your business which is to say music was disrupted by technology. Um, unfortunately, for those of us in the print business, the uh, newspaper business has been disrupted in large part by technology. Why is the TV business not disrupted yet, and will it be? In a, it, Look, for the worse, not the better. A Couple of things. First of all, brands triumph. So in, in our case, because we've spent a lot of time continuing to build and evolve and, and cultivate our brand, we think our brand's worth something. And we think fair price is the antidote to free. And in order for us to continue to make investments in content, we need to have a, a model that we can monetize. But we also need to evolve. 
And the reason that we announced uh, on March 9th that we were going to deliver a standalone streaming service is we wanted flexibility in our business model. And we wanted that flexibility because that's where the consumer was going. And we wanted people to be able to watch HBO however they wanted, wherever they wanted, when they wanted it. And we think that fair pricing is the antidote to free, and we still believe that. You know, the, the, the remarkable thing about what Richard and they're doing at HBO, and you have to give a lot to Jeff Buchers as well, is that these guys, the, the enemy of a progressive art, movies, music, or whatever you're doing, is the public market, because you have to react to that. These guys are doing this in a public company. That is not easy to do, because we got thrown out of Time Warner because it was because Jerry Levin said to me when, when we were getting thrown out, he said, "You know, my son teaches in school for his son passed." He said, "My son teaches in Harlem, and he uses Tupac as his one of his one of his uh, some of his lyrics to teach." And he says, "So I understand." He says, "But I've got the cable bill coming up, and I got Senator Dole driving me nuts, and I got the public company, and I got to get rid of you guys." And the irony of that. And he shot me on the spot. And the know? irony of that decision. <laughs> The irony of that decision, of course, is at that moment when the decision was made to sell Interscope back to Jimmy, who then went to Universal with it and created the ascendant music company uh, of the last 15 years, Warner Music from that moment on was never the same company. Right. And so ironically, the valuation of a big part of then Time Warner declined because Jerry, with all due respect, did not follow the fundamental tenet of running a creative company which is respect for the content. Okay, but here's a different question then, which is into, with, with technology, does the platform matter? And does it matter as much? And I, I don't know, Brian Grazer's here, and I, I hope I'm not gonna misquote you. Oh, there you are. We were talking this morning, and we were having a conversation on the air about you wanna find, you wanna, if you have a show, you wanna find a compatible platform, but in this era, in this day and age, where there's Netflix and Hulu and everybody, yeah. that, a lot of times, people now think of Game of Thrones as its own brand. Game of Thrones is a brand. And, yeah, but, and, but and how not, much does it matter? But Game of Thrones is not disaggregated from HBO, right? If you want to watch Game of Thrones when it's on in that particular season, you have to be an HBO subscriber. You can watch it on HBO Go, right, if you're a subscriber, which means right. you can watch it on Apple TV, you can watch it on Android, you can watch it on a tablet, or you can get HBO Now. But you're going to have to wait a period of time before you can buy that on iTunes or you can right. buy that on, on DVD. But in music, it's even worse, right? Taylor Swift. It's a different business. Where, where I was going to go with this, because and I want to I want to get your take on the Taylor Swift um, situation. Um, but Taylor Swift is her own brand, right? And, yeah, and people course. will people will find her. It's not. Is it, it's but it's not, always been like that in music. You know, they didn't buy Bruce Springsteen because he was on Columbia Records. You know, Bruce Springsteen, now here's the other side, Bruce Springsteen went to Columbia Records because of Bob Dylan. Right. So that's where the brand matters and what you're doing is how you treat your artists Absolutely. and how great, you know, and how you make sure that they're handled properly by all the people, you know, handles are probably the right word. So that's where the brand benefits there. They know, no one, unless it was Motown, there were a few, few freak situations where people would buy the label or Def Jam, you know. Right. But, um, no, the label benefits because Bruce Springsteen said he wanted that red label. I want to ask you both about fragmentation in the media, because one of the things that has happened is the shared experience uh, that so many of us had uh, when we were younger doesn't seem to be the same. Maybe you have different views on this. I want to read something uh, that, that Jimmy said. I think you said this back in 1997 in Rolling Stone. You said, if a kid doesn't grow up seeing a Kiss concert. I was concert, just a kid when I read, said that. Uh, if a kid doesn't grow up seeing a Kiss concert or remembering the first moment he saw the Beatles, maybe he's going to remember something else, like the first day he played fucking Mortal Kombat. <laughs> That's a great quote. It's a great quote. <laughs> Does it matter? Does it matter that we don't have the same type of shared experiences? And well, can I we think, I the, think the problem that we, that we have in music is I believe it slipped. Music was number one and number two in most young people's hearts, right? If you said to your niece or nephew or whatever, your, 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 kid, your teenager friend, kid, and you said to him, okay, or her, you failed math, only two apps on your phone, neither one of them would be music. And that scares me. That's my personal opinion. I have no research, but I could just feel that from living every day. Instagram, right? I mean, where do you want to start? Netflix, whatever it is. HBO would be, Now. Would be, 
would be ahead of music. And a lot of that is because it's so ubiquitous and it's such a, it, the album being affected the way it is. And there's so many things. First of all, Instagram is not the greatest thing if you want to be an important. Going back to that thing about labels saying international stars, do I really want to know that Jim Morrison is shopping right now? <laughs> no. I want to think that he lives like that, you know? But, you know, so I'm pro Instagram, but I don't think we need to know everything about every artist, and that chips away at Mystique. And it chips away at all of that stuff. So you have to, the label's responsibility is to figure out ways to work with their artists to rebuild that thing. For us, you know, social has been a tremendous turbocharge, a tremendous amplifier of all of our shows. So you watch the social media go up. We have 106 million social media connections, you know, across the course of a year. Uh, Dwayne Johnson is tweeting about his show. John Oliver we put on YouTube and it gets, you know, eight, nine million views when we just put his main story on. Um, we have tremendous f Facebook traffic on some of our uh, shows that we do a pilot on or we do a trailer on. So for us, it's just a, a, a continued vehicle to get the community thinking about our brand, getting to think about our shows, and hopefully creating a new generation of addicts, which is what we're in the business of trying to do for our brand through our shows and through our content. What can you tell us about how well the new HBO Go or o the HBO OTT product is working and who is buying that and are there people that are cutting the cord to go get that? The answer to the second question is no. There's absolutely no. Look, there were two digs on us when we announced um, last October that we were going to build a standalone streaming service, right? One was, could we do it? Were we going to be able to do it? And the second was, wouldn't it be so disruptive and so cannibalistic of our linear business? And the resounding answer is yes and no. And so the truth of the matter is, we've always looked at it as additive. We've always looked at it as just expanding the pie and giving people more opportunities. By the way, not only through our digital partners, not only through Apple and Amazon and Roku and eventually PlayStation and Xbox, but also with our current partners. They can bundle HBO now. So we think there are 10 to 15 million, we know there are 10 to 15 million additional homes out in the country that want HBO. Our job over the coming couple of years is to go get those 10 to 15 million new subscribers. We're going to do that with all means at our disposal, and one of them, one of them is going to be HBO Now, but there will be multifaceted distributors. Right. What can you tell us on Apple Music? Yeah, the first three months were free, now we're in the transition period. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, because I, 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 I can't bullshit, so I, and my friends that know me in the room know Are that, I, that I, I have bullshit. an express from my brain to my mouth, so I have a problem. <laughs> but Apple has taught me to not give out numbers really well, right? Um, but I could tell you that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't going really well. We have a couple of issues. We have some stuff that we really have to work on, but we're three months old. And when you work at Apple, you do everything in the window of Bloomingdale's. You know, there's no beta, there's nothing. You're like, okay, so what do you want to fix? Sorry? What do you want to fix? You said there are a couple of things you want to fix. I mean, it, it's like anything. I, you know, I used to master records in, the, in, in Tower Records. You know, I, I, I never stop. So, and Trent Reznor never stops. And we're always trying to tweak it, but we're very satisfied with the idea. You know, and what, where it came from is, what we're trying to do is, one of my biggest issues, and what I'm happy about with Apple, and most happy with, with Apple, is that they're trying to keep that cross, the, the, the crossroad of um, technology and liberal arts going. And Tim is very aware of it, and very, very important to him, and so is Eddie. Of course, and when I was in the media, just in the media business, uh, bottom line is most media companies are technologically inept, and most technology companies are culturally inept. You know, just because you go to uh, Burning Man doesn't make you Hunter Thompson. You know, <laughs> and um, so you know, so it, it takes. They need to give people the. The media business needs to have real tech people and give them stripes, and the, and the tech people need to give media people the stripes in their company, or else it's always going to be this. 
It's going to be like uh, the Star Wars bar at Tatooine, you know what I mean? And no one's going to know what the hell's going on. I would just add, exa Jimmy's exactly right. We've spent like and invested. Exactly right. We've spent it and invested a lot in the tech part of our company. We've also leaned into our partners, new relationships like Apple, and 50 percent of our viewership on HBO Go and HBO Now is with Apple. They were our first digital partner, and we know what we don't know. We don't pretend right. to know what we don't know, and we look to people who know a lot right. more about technology to help guide us and to bring us into the new world. But we also realized we needed to position ourselves to be able to grow in the coming years, and that's why we leaned right. in. See, to see the, the thing we're trying to do at Apple Music is merge a utility with culture. Most of these services are utilities. You, it will not scale in subscription and music, in my opinion, as just a utility. You have to merge these worlds. And when you do, you will become of service. And therefore, people will pay for it. Do you need to own the content? Is there ever a day where you think Apple's going to own that? Would they ever own HBO? Would you ever sell? Uh, do you ever think Apple will be the, the proud owner of HBO? Uh, I, I don't think. I think that's above my pay grade. Look, I do really but, well. Um, I, I do really well, but that's that above my pay grade. That, that they're a part both of you. <laughs> Um, I mentioned Taylor Swift real quick, and I just want to ask, what did you think of that whole situation? Well, I was, I, was, I was fortunately in the middle of it, although it was, it was uh, Father's Day, and for Father's Day I got espadrilles and Taylor Swift, so it was a real headache that day, you know? <laughs> and um, she wrote that letter, Eddie Q called me up and said, wow, this is an incredible letter, look at this thing. I said, yeah, I looked at it, I looked at it at 6.30, you know? I said, what are we going to do? He goes, well, we're going to respond, we're going to deal with this. He called up Tim, this is a Sunday, this is Apple the biggest company in the world. We worked all day Sunday, Eddie, Tim, and they would clue me, uh, 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 have me join in, and they dealt with it on the spot on a Sunday morning on Father's Day. It was, a, it was unbelievable. They moved like lightning, right. and I was really impressed, and Taylor was impressed, and they did the right thing, more That's importantly. It. Both of you guys have had a lot of success, so I want to ask the, I want to ask the proverbial regret question. Uh, I'm going to go with Richard first. Thank you. Um, so, uh, with the exception of Billions, what is the one show that you wish you could have had on HBO? Uh, um, look, I, I, I loved Mad Men, and I, I've said before, I, I think the only thing wrong with Mad Men is that it wasn't on HBO. Um, and um, I thought they did a great job with it over an extended period. I thought uh, Matt did a great job. John Hamm was unbelievable. I, I, you know, you can't, we, the truth is, we don't sit and regret what we, you know, might have had. We sit and we focus on what we want and who we want to work with. And um, we actually spend very little time congratulating ourselves uh, for any of, you know, success that we have because we're too busy thinking about what's next. And we spend even less time regretting what might have been. But if you ask me honestly, what's the show that I loved that I wish had been on the network? It's Mad Men. Okay, we're going to open up to questions, so actually I don't know where the mics are going to be, uh, but in, in the meantime, who's the one artist you wished you could have worked with? Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, there's so many, you know, I do have a lot of regrets, you know, and, uh, and I, I, there are so many great artists, you know, uh, Amy Winehouse is somebody that I could have worked with, Lucian Grange was so incredible to, to, to his show. Was show that a miss, though, you. like you didn't see it? Or I, Amy Winehouse, I was jet lagged and I was in London and Lucian came to me and said, you know some, you might be interested in this. I said, Lucian, you know, I can't deal with it right now. I got too many headaches, you know, Eminem was falling off a building, you know, it was all that stuff. <laughs> but uh, there are so many uh, great artists that I, I could have he, gotten. He's seen, he's seen a lot more than he's missed. I think that's... Yeah, right. well, that's the idea. That's why, you, you know, you have a job because you... You, 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 you have more can, than a job. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, let's open up for questions. Uh, I imagine there are a lot out there. I don't know where the microphones are first, but when we uh, go over here. So do you ever see a day where everything becomes direct artist to consumer and things like record labels and television networks become obsolete? Well, uh, from my perspective, you said music first. Uh, from my perspective is it's up to the labels. The labels uh, have to reinvent themselves, right? If they, and, they, and they have to 
keep their importance in the artist's life. And that's really that simple uh, to me, you know, and I think they are doing that. I think, uh, I think my old company, I know they're doing that and everybody's working really hard to uh, reinvent themselves. They have to, 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 to inject themselves in, uh, in the actual uh, sequence. Yeah, I think it's a long time before we break out of some form of curation. And so what's gonna happen, is what I think it is multilateral, we're gonna have myriad distributors across you know, all different kinds of platforms. The key is make sure that your brand can survive in whatever ecosystem you're in and make sure whether it's a virtual MVPD, whether it's a digital distributor, whether it's Comcast or AT&T Direct, that everybody wants your content. And so as long as we're capable of moving in any direction, the evolution's gonna be what the evolution is gonna be and we're gonna do uh, just fine. I think we got a question right over here. So Richard, Jimmy says that the biggest problem in music is free. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And yet, you guys have millions of people pirating yeah. Game of Thrones and everything. Sucks. So why won't the same things that happen in the music business happen to the TV business as more and more people get Broadway? And no, that was the answer, not the question. <laughs> yeah, look, we were, were, were very, very um, vigilant. Uh, as vigilant as we can be about piracy. As you know, peer-to-peer -peer is a very complicated thing. Most of the piracy is global, and so in addition to moving things you know, off sites as quickly as we can, we're also trying to compress the windows as fast as we can so that we you know, disincentivize people from doing that. It's an issue, but the truth of the matter is there's still you know, 125 million people across the globe paying for HBO. That's not even including our licensing deals and home of HBO deals in Western Europe and in different parts uh, of the world. So our basic understanding of all this is, look, there's, there's always gonna be a piece of it. By the way, people have ripped off HBO since even before I joined the company in 1992. Piracy is always, we've always thought we've lost at least 10, sometimes more percent of our subscriber base. So the key is create a value that's fair for the consumer, give them something that they want across all kinds of different platforms, and we think that's the best way to address it. But we're paying attention to it all the time, as, as, and we look at password sharing as well all the time. Well, I, I, I slightly disagree with that. I, I'll, I'll tell you why. The, um, I, I agree with all of it, except as I think the answer to that question is yes, which I thought was your question. You know, your, your question was yes, because Unless media companies get better, more adept at technology, and unless the technology companies get more adept at, at, at culture, there's no way for this to work. What'll happen is, the dirty little secret is these companies will merge. Merida, uh, Sony, bought Columbia Records and Columbia Pictures. He had the right idea. Unfortunately, he died. And um, that was the right idea, but what happened was when management changed, it fell apart and then Apple took up the mantle. They had the Walkman, they had the Ghetto Blaster, they had music, they had it all. They had, a li they had Universal's license at Sony and they couldn't get it off the ground because of management. So what'll happen is, you know, the dirty little secret. Tech companies will buy media companies or if the media company can figure out a way to, to, to get the right tech people and really understand what's going on or buy a smaller company and do their, they have to understand distribution. Media companies don't understand, in my opinion, real distribution on how to communicate. Tech, they, we always relied, I'm speaking for myself, I always relied on somebody coming out of the woods and doing distribution for us. Well, that, that's not gonna work, because the media, because the tech companies are gonna come and get and ask you to do it for free. We're seeing right now, right? So something's gotta give, or there's gotta be a merger to where there's really firepower in, in the distribution. And all, to my point further, why we began to partner with the tech companies that we began to partner with. And of course, look, as long, as long, the, the problem with the music business and, and Jimmy obviously is, is much more adept at answering this than me, but the problem with the music business was they were shoving a product at people for $20 that people didn't want because maybe they wanted one song or two, right, which is what Steve Jobs figured out. What we're trying to do is give people a lot of content across a lot of different disciplines for Hollywood movie studios. We're trying to give that to them for a fair price 
And I think one of the reasons we've seen more growth at HBO in the last two years than any time in our history, both domestically and internationally, is because we've come to a fair price value. But Richard, no matter what it you doesn't, do, it doesn't preclude the agenda. About the agendas are different. The agendas are different, and until the agendas are, re are remotely similar, it, uh, I don't believe it, 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 it can work. You know, like, that's why at Apple, I'm so jazzed about it because they are committed to get people too. paid for music, and they brought us in. They brought in 300 lunatics into that company. 300. Then you get one guy from the creative side. They got 300, and we're in there making a mess, you know, and because we're, we were able to decide on a, on a common agenda, and most tech companies have a different agenda than the media companies, so that's why you have what you have. I, I, again, that's what I believe. YouTube? Well, I mean, YouTube has their own agenda. Their agenda is that everything flows through it, and it's really nice. I mean, here's a little stat. I'm not sure. Lucian Grange is here. Tell me if I'm close. They're 40% of the consumption of music, and they're 4% of the revenue. That's a problem. Let's say I'm off by 10%, right? So that's bullshit. You know what I mean? So if I'm an artist, like, what do I do now, right? How do I do that? So, you know, they got to get this. They got to get it together. You know, they know that that doesn't work, but do they care? I have no idea. <laughs> I wish it wasn't so. We have to wrap up. Final question to you about the preacher and teacher here. Yeah. Um, you guys spent a lot of time together. Greatest lesson. Maybe, maybe it happened today, right here. The, the, the greatest Jimmy Ivey lesson? Uh, uh, if the shit gets bigger than the cat, well, you get rid of the cat. Get rid of the cat. <laughs> Jimmy Ivey and Richard Pleppler, thank you for the conversation, everybody. Thank you, sir.